All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody uh, to another town hall meeting with the Tort Clinton Committee. Uh, John Humphrey here with Doug Kennedy and John Lucas and Jim Stang, our council. And um, we're gonna get right to it tonight. Uh, you have heard uh, my story uh, as, a, as a survivor and Doug's as well. It was in the first recording. You can go to the BSA or tccbsa.com website to, to listen to those. Um, tonight, we're gonna hear a lot about <clears throat> this plan that's been filed uh, by the BSA. We're gonna try to keep it just under an hour. Um, the email address that was on the slide, uh, BSA survivors at pszjlaw.com is where you can submit questions and we will be answering those. As you can see that we've done some of those before. We did pull some questions out that people have been asking and we'll get to that at the end. So why are we here today? Uh, for those of you who have joined all of our town halls, you're going to hear this broken record. <laughs> We're here to answer questions about the chapter 11 bankruptcy let you know a little bit about what the TCC does day in and day out, educate you in the process, and obviously today talk about uh, the, the plan that BSA has filed. We're not here to provide legal advice for you personally. It's very informational. It's third in a series, and we're um, excited to try to communicate with you guys on a regular basis. If you're looking at your calendar, it's the second Thursday of every month. We're trying to do this. So you can put that on your calendar. And <clears throat> so before I turn it over uh, to Doug, I just wanted you all to know that the, the group is working hard. Uh, we continue to have a lot of new developments. There's a lot of moving parts. And uh, before we get Jim on and John to talk about uh, the plan itself, I'd like to turn things over to Doug. Doug? Thanks, John. I, I appreciate all you do for us, buddy. I've told you that before, but I just want everybody to know that you, you work hard for every victim out there, and that's so appreciated. Uh, I, I want to say good evening to everyone. And also, what I want to talk about tonight is the fact that the TCC has tried to be transparent in what it does. We try and communicate as much as we can. Uh, the reality, though, is that our work is also under what's called mediation confidentiality. And because of that, there are a lot of things that we can't talk about. Uh, that's just part of the process. But as we go through this process, we wanna be able to share as much as we can. And we thought it'd be valuable tonight if we just talked a little bit about how the TCC is viewing where we are in the bankruptcy and maybe some thoughts that might help you think through this as well. Uh, the nine of us on the TCC have been working as volunteers for the last year. Uh, I think last weekend was the, our one year anniversary. And there's some things that we've come to realize that might help you as a victim. And that's who I'm really trying to address tonight are the victims so that you have a, a little bit of an idea and, and maybe your thought process will be headed in the right directions sort of towards a bankruptcy direction more than anything else. As John mentioned, you're going to hear from our professionals that are going to talk tonight about the plan that's been submitted as well as uh, the pro uh, profile of claims, the analysis of claims too. But what I want to do right now is I, I want to talk to the victims. And if you're like me, you woke up last week and you saw the headlines 
And the headlines all said something to the effect of the Boy Scouts filed their bankruptcy plan. Every victim's going to get $6,000 a piece. And if you're like me, you are probably disgusted by that. Our professionals are gonna talk about what that really means, but the best piece of advice that TCC can give you right now about those headlines is simple, ignore them. They make good headlines, they make splashy news, but ignore them. And we're gonna try and understand, we're gonna try and explain why tonight. You know, I'm speaking on behalf of the TCC, but personally, I taught my, my children not to use the word hate because it's an ugly word and you only want to use it when it's absolutely necessary. But I use it tonight to tell you that I, the TCC, we hate the fact that the Boy Scouts have put us in this position to be claimants in a bankruptcy proceeding. Since its inception, the Scouts had a responsibility to protect its members, to protect us from abuse. And as you know, from personal history, as you'll hear more about tonight, the Boy Scouts have failed in doing that. Our professionals are going to discuss the analysis of the claims, but something that you need to consider as we go through this is that since 1990, and that's an important date because in 1990, the Boy Scouts established and started following many of the youth protection protocols that are in place today. Since 1990, we now know that there are 11,000 claims of abuse. 11,000 in the past 30 years alone. So the solution to the Boy Scouts problem up until last year has been to fight every case it could. And then when it couldn't do that anymore because it was, didn't have the ability to do so, that's when it filed its bankruptcy. So what happened to all of us then was we didn't become part of sort of a justice system. We became part of a bankruptcy business process. And what we want you to understand is that bankruptcy is a business. We hate to say that, but it's it. it is. It's business when the Boy Scouts enter bankruptcy with the goal of paying us off as little as possible so that they can keep as much as possible and then continue to operate. That was business for the Boy Scouts. That's the business of bankruptcy. And for the nine men on the TCC, it's unfortunately what we have to remind each other of all the time. It's tough to say, it's hard to think about, but the reality is that bankruptcy is business and we're part of it. So there's five things that I really wanna highlight. Uh, the first one is uh, the TCC has uh, read, heard people saying that we just wanna put the Boy Scouts out of business. What I wanna say is this, within its first hour of meeting in Wilmington, Delaware, when we were selected, we were put in a room, we started to get organized, within our first hour, what we decided was that the future of the Boy Scouts was not our mission. Our mission quite simply was to come up with the maximum amount of compensation for every victim possible. Whether that means the Boy Scouts continues afterwards or not was not our concern. What our concern was, was the maximum amount of compensation for victims. That is still our number one concern and mission. The second piece of this, is that while we're trying to get compensation for the Boy Scouts, that also means getting the max amount of compensation from local councils, insurers, and sponsoring organizations. You might have read that the Boy Scouts are now expecting the local councils to voluntarily contribute $300 million to our fund, to a fund for victims. Well, the professionals have been pouring over the financial records, they've been looking at statements, that's business. We've been trying to figure out whether or not that, that amount of money is appropriate. And you probably know what the answer is to that and then what a more appropriate number is. But at the same time that the TCC and its professionals are doing that work with the local councils, insurers, and uh, sponsoring organizations, we really want to implore you that if you can file suit against any of those parties, that you should do so. If you have an attorney, discuss with an attorney your opportunity to bring suit against your abuser, local counsel, insurer, sponsoring organizations. If you're unsure whether or not you can do that, please seek out advice from an attorney. Bankruptcy is a business. And the reality is that that pressure from litigation, those lawsuits that are hanging over organizations' heads, that will make them come to the table 
and add to that compensation that's going to assist all victims. The third piece of this, aside from the business of bankruptcy, is the fate of your abuser. Again, if you can bring suit against your abuser, do so. If you're not sure, speak to an attorney. Speak to an attorney about whether or not you can and whether or not you should. But also part of this are what are called in bankruptcy non-monetary demands. The TCC is committed to addressing non-monetary demands at the appropriate time. The Boy Scouts have held the names of accused abusers, what they call the ineligible volunteers or the IV files. They've held these files privately and we're committed to seeing them be made public. As well, we're committed to the Boy Scouts doing something about its youth protection program. As I mentioned, 11,000 claims in the last 30 years since those protocols were enacted. The TCC wants to address both those things, but the time for non-monetary demands will be after we deal with the appropriate amount of compensation. So we don't want anybody to think we aren't concerned or forgotten about that. We will when it's the appropriate time. And then lastly, and I think I might've said there's five things, but I think there's four. The TCC has a special message for the insurers. The vast majority of victims have been dealing with their abuse for years. We've been patient. We've gotten ready for the fight that's before us right now. Well, we're not going to be bought off quickly or cheaply with the first low bull offer. The TCC and every victim is going to fight for what it's owed them. And we're going to fight hard. So we don't want anyone to think that we're going to roll over on that. So let me close by, again, giving you the best piece of advice I can give you right now. Ignore those headlines. What you're going to learn tonight is that this is another step in a long process. We're going to talk about the bankruptcy plan and disclosures and what that means to us. And hopefully after tonight, you'll have a little bit better idea of how this process works. Unfortunately, why it's business and why we're trying to conduct that business aggressively. We want you to be patient. We want you to be strong. And we want you to know that the TCC has your back and we're working hard and our professionals are working hard. So please everyone hang in there, stay strong. And I hope tonight's valuable. Thanks. John, back to you. Thanks Doug, really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I echo Doug's comments, you know, for, for us who've been doing this and talking about it for the last year, um, you know, it, it, it rings in our hearts. And we know that some of you are telling families for the first time, kids for the first time, grandkids for the first time, spouses, and um, we know it's really hard. We know it's difficult. So just hang in there and know that we're doing everything we can to represent you fairly. Tonight, we have three topics. Uh, Jim's going to cover the plan uh, overview and what we know about what's been filed by the BSA. And then John uh, Lucas is going to cover <clears throat> the claims data and how things shake out so far. And then we're going to spend some time on five or six questions that uh, we've fielded um, through the uh, BSA survivors email address that you guys have. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jim and... Uh, have you lead us through the plan discussion, Jim? Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, Jim Stang, Chelsky Stang, Zeeland Jones. I'm one of the several bankruptcy lawyers representing the Tort Claimants Committee. So the Boy Scouts filed two pleadings of significance in connection with the resolution of this case. One is called a plan of reorganization. It actually is labeled the amended plan of reorganization. And it's amended because on the first day of the bankruptcy, the Boy Scouts filed what in effect was a placeholder plan that really had very little content. The, in some ways, the plan that they amended and filed had very little content, but we'll talk about that uh, tonight. The second document they filed is called a disclosure statement. The purpose of this disclosure statement is to provide each of you enough information about the Boy Scouts financial condition, its plan, so that you can make an informed decision on whether to accept the plan or reject it. The disclosure statement has to be approved by Judge Silverstein, the bankruptcy judge, before it is sent to you 
with the plan and a ballot to vote yes or no. So right now, the TCC and other groups representing survivors are pouring over the disclosure statement to see if it has enough information in it. It doesn't have to have every detail about the Boy Scouts in it, but enough so that you can make an informed decision. And the work that we are doing, that Berkeley Research Group is doing, they are our forensic accountants, has in a sense all led to a critique of the disclosure statement. The disclosure statement hearing for approval of the disclosure statement is set currently for April 15th. I, you could knock me over with a feather and uh, I'm six foot six and weigh 255 pounds if it actually happened that day. This is a process of editing, of getting more information out of the Boy Scouts. And while we may have a hearing on April 15th, I suspect the disclosure statement will not be approved that day. Once the disclosure statement, excuse me, is approved by the court, it will be put in an envelope with the plan of reorganization and the ballot and be sent out for creditors to vote yes or no. We'll talk a little bit later about exactly how that process of getting these documents to you will actually work. So um, I just wanna take one thing, um, two things up front, and then John's gonna put up some slides that will walk us through in more detail what I've been talking about. Uh, the first is, um, uh, Doug said that the local councils were going uh, aspirationally going to put up $300,000. It actually is $300 million. Um, when you've got 85,000 claimants, um, one can say it moved the needle a little bit, but we'll talk about that as well. Uh, what is a material amount of money? The other thing is what John mentioned, which is the headline, $6,000. There are going to be three sources of money in this case. One is the Boy Scouts and its insurers. The and its insurers is always an, a, a, an add-on, if you will. So you got the Boy Scouts and, their, and its insurers. You have the local councils and their insurers. And you have chartered organizations and their insurers. Right now, the only commitment that has actually been made to put money towards the payment of survivors is the Boy Scout contribution. The local councils have not signed a piece of paper saying we are collectively putting up this amount. The Boy Scouts actually in their plan have said, we hope they will put up this amount and judge we will check in with you in about 60 days to tell you how that fundraising is going. Now we've met with groups of the local councils and they may be some or all of them may be behind that number, but we don't have that commitment from them. The other group, the chartered organizations, there's no dollar amount at all. You know, they, there are some chartered organizations that have come into the mediation process to discuss a resolution of their responsibility for the abuse. But in terms of a dollar amount putting up, being put up, crickets. So when we say $6,000 a person, we have taken what we believe is the value of the BSA's promise, which consists of cash, some real estate, the Norman Rockwell collection, and we've come up with a value for that. And that value is informed by our own work and some information supplied by the Boy Scouts. And then we divided it by 85,000, which is the number of claims filed in the case. You've heard a higher number, but this is the number net of duplicates because some people filed for one reason or another, more than one claim. That number comes out to be about 6,000. That's where that number comes from. So. Um, it's a headline number. It's a number, frankly, that the TCC um, announced because we wanted to demonstrate how pathetic it was. But I want you all to know that there are other sources of money. And I have been doing representing creditors committees like this committee since 2004. I've probably done 18 committees in the context of sexual abuse claims. There is not a single case, not one, where a plan has been confirmed over the unified rejection of abuse survivors. And so um, we talk a lot about at meetings about unity, about working together. If there is a solid message from survivors that this plan is not acceptable, I cannot imagine a circumstance where Judge Silverstein will confirm it over the strong and unified objection of survivors.
So when they say hang in there, uh, hang in there. So John, if we put up the slides, um, we'll start walking through the plan and disclosure statement. Okay, let's that. Let's go to the next one. John is new at this, so give him a moment to figure out how to go to the next slide. There we go. So the documents, as I said, include the plan and the disclosure statement. The ballot is literally something you will vote on and it will ask you to accept or reject the plan. There may be some other decisions you have to make on the ballot, but that is the primary one. The last thing that will certainly go into the envelope are position letters. There are people, uh, the TCC, I should say groups. There are groups representing different interests. Uh, the TCC represents all abuse survivors. There are other groups that have formed together on an informal basis to represent a subset of that, um, uh, of the entire universe of abuse survivors. Um, they may be able to put a letter in and the letter will say to you, we, I'll just talk about the TCC letter, we recommend you vote for the plan, and this is why, or we recommend you vote against the plan, and this is why. Um, right now, I'm going to surprise you, that the Boy Scouts have said the only people that can put position letters into the envelope are those that endorse their plan. Now, that's not the way this works, and I'm sure Judge Silverstein, uh, we know from another case that is uh, on her docket now, will allow the committees to put in position letters on the plan. And so um, you'll know where we come out other than through these town halls on the plan that's actually being voted on. So John, let's go on to the next one. Hey Jim, I just wanna point out for everybody that on the top of this slide here, there's a, our website address there for more information and for questions again there. If you wanna write that down, it'll be on every slide. Thank you, John. So what is, what is the plan? First of all, understand it is a proposed plan. It is not the plan. There is only one out there, but it's been proposed. It has not been approved by the court. And actually there's not been a hearing on any aspect of the Boy Scout case since the plan was filed. So we don't even have the off the cuff comments coming from the judge. So um, just keep that in mind. And for those of you that are really gluttons for punishment, if you want to read the plan, Go to the Omni site, O-M-N-I, type in O-M-N-I Management Boy Scouts. You'll come up to the Omni site. Omni is the court designated company that maintains the docket of the court. And go to document under dockets, go to document 2293. That is the amended plan. It's fairly long. It's very technical. But if you want to try it, give it a go. So what the plan does is it takes creditors and puts them into groups. So there will be a group of creditors who provided goods and services to the Boy Scouts. There will be a group of, we call them classes. There will be a class or group of creditors, let's say uh, JP Morgan. And JP Morgan holds a mortgage on different properties belonging to BSA. There, maybe one or two other classes. We're gonna actually go through them in a few minutes to show you what I'm talking about in a very Boy Scout centric way. But abuse survivors will be in a group. The plan will tell each group how it is going to be treated under the plan and how you're gonna get paid. And we are one of the things that's really amazing about the Boy Scout plan is it doesn't tell you how your claim is going to get paid. It is to be followed, if you will, document to be followed on how your proof of claim will be evaluated, how a dollar amount will be put to that proof of claim. And once a dollar amount is put to the proof of claim, what actual dollars will you get? That process is referred to sometimes as a trust distribution process because a trust will be established to hold the money and the property and to then effectuate the process on how your claim is evaluated. But when you read the plan that's on file and when you read the disclosure statement, it ain't there folks. So uh, that's part of the having to take a deep breath about this and why this is at best a proposed plan. 
And then there is the asset strategy. The Boy Scouts are proposing to give to the trust, which is the mechanism for uh, reducing things to cash and getting money out to you. They're giving them the Norman Rockwell collection. They're giving it something called Scout University. Uh, they're giving some cash. Uh, so it's a combination of property and cash. And so the, those assets have to be turned into money. And the plan will talk about how that's done. Now on this, uh, we'll talk about local councils in a minute, but that's what the plan does is a proposed resolution of the claims in each class. So John, let's move on. So these are the classes. So you'll see, um, just to explain some of the terminology, you have other priority claims. The bankruptcy code gives claims some priority over others. For example, wage claims come first in the distribution of money. Not surprisingly, tax claims come first in the distribution of money. How does the plan treat those claims? They are, next column, unimpaired, which means that the plan does not change anyone's rights. They will be paid as required by other, be it state law or federal law. And because they are unimpaired, they don't get to vote yes or no on the plan because they don't have they, they don't have any uh, skin in the game. They, they're not affected by the plan. They were affected by the bankruptcy and they weren't paid, but under the plan, they will be in full. The next category is, and by the way, these classes are the classes in the plan. So if you're looking for anyone in particular to see how they're treated, you go by claim, your class number. The next is other secured claims. That would be if they owned a house and there was a mortgage on it, um, what do you do with that mortgage payment? It's unimpaired. Again, they don't vote. Classes 3A, 3B, 4A, and 4B are J.P. Morgan. That J.P. Morgan had different extensions and loan extensions of credit and loans to the Boy Scouts. They have cut a deal with the Boy Scouts. Therefore, they are impaired. They, the plan and the deal effect affects them and they are entitled to vote. Now, specifically with JP Morgan, which has a very substantial claim, the credit, the tort claimants committee, I believe it was done today, or if not today, it'll be done by the end of the week, is filed a pleading with the bankruptcy court, telling the court that we think there are problems with JP Morgan's mortgage, that it should not be treated as a secured creditor on certain property, and that the effect of knocking out its mortgage or secured claim would be free up more money for the rest, of, for everybody else. We can't bring that lawsuit against JP Morgan without the courts giving us the green light. And the motion that we are going to either filed or going to file um, is asking the court to give us the green light to do that. So while a, the plan, the proposed plan offers a proposed settlement with JPN, the position of the tort claimants committee is that that settlement should not be approved, that JP Morgan has more to give, if you will, or give up, and that the plan, the, the settlement should not be approved. But under the plan, the settlement is set forth and they are entitled to vote on the plan. Um, convenience claims are just claims that are too small to uh, hassle with. And so if someone's owed uh, say under $1,000. I don't know exactly the number in the plan, but usually it's a relatively small amount. And so if you're willing to reduce your claim to $1,000 or whatever the cutoff number is, um, you just get um, the, uh, that payment and you're done. And it's impaired because you've reduced your claim to that amount. General unsecured claims would be uh, the people who make the uniforms, the people who make the badges. Um, Everybody really except people who suffered personal injury. There is a proposal to pay them. The proposal is that they get paid somewhere between 75% and 100% of what they are owed. And because the plan affects how they are paid, they are impaired and they get to vote. Non-abuse litigation claims is mostly personal injury other than abuse. Tragically, scouts were killed or injured uh, on, in, at scout events. And so they are treated differently than the abuse claims. They're impaired, they get to vote. 
Number eight is us, the direct abuse claims. As I said before, it is on, the plan does very little to tell you how the claims are going to get treated. I was once told by someone, creditors have two questions, how much and when. Plan does not tell us the answers to either of those questions. So on its face, we think the plan should be rejected. We have an idea of what they are going to propose in more detail, and we're not happy with that either. So um, under the plan, you all will get to vote because you're impaired. You're not going to get, um, you're not going to be turning the clock back and going back to your to your state court proceedings. And for those that you didn't file um, in state court, you know, it, it, your rights are impacted. So you're going to get to vote. Indirect abuse claims, it's a little technical, but they're also affected by the plan. And then the last is interest in Delaware BSA. That was a company they established to try to get uh, the, their case in front of a Delaware judge because they weren't happy with the prospects of, I guess, a judge in Texas. Um, they, it doesn't vote. It, it's, um, it's a technical issue. You don't have to bother with it. Class A is what you need to be concerned about. And the reason I went over these other classes was just to show you how this works in terms of a structure, that some people are unimpaired by the plan and some people are impaired by the plan. So John, let's go to the next slide. So again, um, where's the money coming from? Debtors committed certain monies. The local council's number is aspirational. Again, 300 million, not 300,000. And anything the chartered organizations is you know, not even an aspirational number at this point. It's aspirational meaning what the Boy Scouts think might be put in. But it can, it's gonna get transferred to a trust so that the survivors can be the ones dealing with and be responsible for and have control over how these properties are going to be liquidated to cash. So there will be some cash, it's not a lot. There will be some personal property, think about the Norman Rockwell paintings, real property, uh, think about uh, Scout U, but not the high adventure facilities. They are not proposing that the trust, that creditors get paid from a liquidation of any of the high adventure facilities. And then rights under insurance policies. As I said before, three sources, but all of them come with insurance to one degree or another. The trust will in effect become the insured party under the insurance policies. So if an insurance company says, um, I'd like to pay you X dollars and in effect tear up the insurance policies, that is a decision that will be made by the trust. If the insurance companies say, we don't owe any money because the Boy Scouts lied on an insurance application that said they had no history of sexual abuse, if anyone could really even believe such an application, um, it would be the trust that would push back and say, no, that's not a defense to your obligation to pay under the insurance policy. So that's what the rights under insurance policies means. It goes to a trust and for many purposes, think about the trust now being as the insured as opposed to BSA being the insured. Who's gonna run the trust? Undecided. The plan and the disclosure statement don't name who it will be, but there will be someone. That trustee will have an advisory committee that will have advisory powers, thus an advisory committee, but also have controls because you don't wanna have a trustee who's going out and making decisions without controls by survivor representatives themselves. Uh, the trustee can hire professionals. For example, if the insurance companies are gonna get sued because they are improperly denying coverage on a claim or claims, the trustee will hire an insurance, what we call an insurance coverage lawyer. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of property here to administer. It could be many millions of dollars. Someone needs to properly manage that money so we get the best rate of return given the uh, fiduciary duty the trustee has to ensure the safety of the money. And then there's the process of evaluating the claims. And the trustee may have some experience in that, but he might hire someone who is truly an expert in evaluating how much a certain kind of abuse claim is worth. So uh, that's what the trust, that's what the trust concept is. John. Next slide, please. So what happens to class eight? As I said to you, the trust distribution procedures aren't in there. 
but the TCC professionals and other professionals representing abuse survivors have a lot of experience in what we call mass tort cases. Think about asbestos. Uh, think about all the products you see ever, uh, where there are lawsuit uh, solicitations at one o'clock in the morning, Roundup, pelvic mesh, um, opioids. Those are mass tort cases, mass in the sense of a lot of people affected. So what often happens is a chart is made of values for the injury suffered. So here we have penetration claims, oral sex claims, masturbation claims, groping claims, those are the classifications that were on the claim form you filled out. So we don't have values set for those, but what you could, this is what you could envision. And folks, please, we don't have these procedures set down. I'm giving you examples of what could happen, that there will be six or seven classes of abuse, and there will be dollar amounts opposite each classification. And so depending on how thoroughly your claim is evaluated, and the credibility of the claim, you might get say 50% of the matrix value. If you go through a more, um, I'll say uh, stringent process of review of your claim, you might get a max, be able to get a maximum of 75%. And if you decided you were gonna go to court and really you might get 100% of that value if you win or even potentially more. But that's what the matrix does. It's meant to give you some values so that you can make a decision how far you want to go with your case, assuming that you meet certain credibility criteria and qualifications. Now, that's the dollar amount assigned to your claim. It doesn't mean you're getting that much money. You might, but it depends on how much is in the trust. And it depends how much we're getting from the insurance companies. And uh, the trust has work to do both in the litigation to get that money in and also to evaluate the claims. And so your claim might have a matrix value of a million dollars, but that doesn't guarantee you you'll get a million. That depends on the performance of the trust. Um, some people have asked, is the statute of limitations gonna affect my claim? And the answer is it might. The matrix will tell you whether or not given where the abuse occurred, what discount, if any, and I want to really emphasize, if any, will be attributed to that. You know, the insurance companies are paying based on what they think their risk is if they had to go to court. And there are some states where they think that risk is pretty low because the statute of limitations is a very difficult thing to overcome. And then there are some people who are abused in states where the statute of limitations doesn't even exist. That doesn't mean that we will discount them uh, on the basis of that description. It means that the parties putting the money in are thinking about that. And believe me, they are thinking about it. They are talking about it. And so there are lots of different ways to look at the survivor community. Statute of limitations is just one of them. The TCC is committed that all, uh, we, we use the term valid claims. That really means honest claims. Because sadly, and I've had this experience, there are some people that gain the system. But for the credible and honest claims, we are committed, no matter where the abuse occurred, that people get some compensation. So I'm not trying to forecast to you too much about this, but I want you to know that this matrix I've described will have different adjustment factors to reflect some of the reality of the litigation that revolves around abuse claims. So uh, John, let's go on to the next slide. Um, I talked about the trustee bringing litigation. Um, I think that bullet point self-explanatory. And the other one also, uh, the trustee will be liquidating whatever non-cash property uh, he or she gets. Next. Um, I think I've touched upon this. The disclosure statement, again, is meant to give you information. It'll summarize the plan. It should tell you what the process is for your claim being treated. It should give you some idea of what your recovery could be. And it'll explain to you the risks of this entire thing working. So um, that's what the disclosure statement is. And for those of you that want to look at that as presently presented, presently presented, as presented, 
Uh, the docket number is 2294 on the Omni site. John, next. Voting. The bankruptcy court has to find, I don't know, I think there are like 16 or 17, maybe there are a few more, um, things that are right about the plan in order for it to get approved. The lawyers sometimes call the approval process confirmation. It's the same thing. Bankruptcy court confirmation of the plan, bankruptcy court approval of the plan, same thing. One of the things the court looks at is how did creditors vote on the plan? And again, voting is by class. Remember, I talked about those classes earlier. So you will get a package that includes the plan disclosure statement and ballot. There is a negotiation going on right now over who actually will vote your ballot. You have the right to vote your claim, you, the survivor. But there's also a process being negotiated where your attorney can vote your claim. It is very important that you be in touch. Now, that hasn't started yet, folks. The, remember, the disclosure statement hasn't even been heard by the court yet. The plan solicitation package is not, not in the mail. But as this process moves on, it will be in the mail. And the question is, who's it going to go to, you or your lawyer? And who's going to actually sign the ballot, you or your lawyer? You make the decision on whether to accept or reject. But because there are so many survivors, there needs to be some ability for lawyers, if their client wants them to, to sign the ballot. So uh, if you have an attorney, you should be talking to that attorney about how the balloting process is going to work insofar as who's going to actually vote the plan. But again, you make the decision. If you're not represented by a lawyer, the plan solicitation package will go to you individually. Um, and as I said, the court holds a confirmation hearing uh, where the Judge Silverstein will have to find that the requirements of the bankruptcy code are satisfied. Uh, voting is one only one aspect of the plan approval process. But as I said, in the history of, sex, of chapter 11 cases revolving around sexual abuse, no court has ever approved a plan that was solidly, solidly opposed by the abuse survivors. Uh, John, next. Okay, um, there will be a deadline for returning the ballot. More to come on that. Um, like I said, we're gonna have these every week. We'll be keeping you advised as to how this whole balloting process is progressing. John, let's go to the next slide. So we, just, we decided to give you a timeline because everyone wants to know, remember the two questions, how much and when? We wanted to give you an idea of when. Now, the chart you're about to see are the dates that are the absolute minimum time periods. And so let's go to the next chart and I'll, the next slide, John. So the plan was filed on March 1st. The earliest the court could approve the, the disclosure statement, not the plan, because remember, you haven't even voted yet, is April 17th. That could be a month, two months, three months further out, but this is the minimum time period we're talking about. And then you got the 17th, if the court did approve the disclosure statement, the packages go out the 29th, and then this will be posted in the um, on our website, and you can study it. But as you can see, there's a packages go out on a certain date, voting is due a certain date, objections uh, to the plan are due a certain date, all June 28th, confirmation hearing, remember that's an approval hearing, July 26th, and then if the court were to approve the plan and if there are no appeals, um, certain things happen, like the deed to the Scout U gets transferred to the trust. Uh, the Norman Rockwell paintings are transferred, if not physically, then by title to the trust. So there are just some kind of gears meshing in place that will happen after the court approves the plan. Remember, these are not the dates that this will necessarily happen. We wanted to show you the timeline that the debtors have proposed so you can get a sense of how long at a minimum, at a minimum, these periods um, could be. John, let's keep going. The last slide, Jim. Ah, the last slide. Everyone's signing sizes sigh of relief. So um, 
I think that is really it on the plan and disclosure statement process. It is early folks. None of this is in concrete. And if you have questions, use our Q&A, the website, the email address, or call your attorney. John, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, so if you didn't hear it kind of loud and clear, um, that timeline that Jim put up was the happy path. Uh, if you're a baseball fan, I would probably say we're in the third or fourth inning and it's gonna take some time. And it's highly unlikely that we're gonna do the happy path. So be patient. Um, Jim said you can read the plan. I wouldn't suggest it. I went through it. There's not enough detail. It'd be like you having a, a trip from Delaware to California and none of the directions were in the map on how you got there. And so, uh, you know, from the TCC's perspective, a total, a total non-starter. And then the last comment I'll make on the voting, uh, the TCC does feel very strongly um, about individual claimants voting. So that will be our position, but um, we may lose that battle depending on how the judge sees it. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to John Lucas to talk about the claims data so far. John, I just want to um, interject something before uh, John Lucas goes. Every creditor has the right to vote their own ballot. If the court says lawyers can sign, she's not saying creditors can't sign. And so whatever, wherever she comes out on whether attorneys can um, sign a, a, a reject ballot with tens of pages of names to follow, if you want to sign your ballot, you get to. There will be no circumstance where you will be required to give that authority over to a lawyer. So just wanted to put that in there, John. The clarification, Jim. Appreciate John Lucas, you're up. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, John Lucas, is, uh, as John and Doug and Jim mentioned, hello. Um, we've spoke before, I think, on some of the other town halls. Um, uh, as Jim said earlier in his remarks, um, and I'll sort of maybe get a little bit more into the details to try to sort of sort of flesh out sort of what's out there in the claims. But uh, you know, as we all know, there are a lot of claims, and so we're trying to sort of maybe categorize them in certain ways to try to give um, some meaning and some different types of definition to the claims so that people can sort of see what the playing field looks like, and so. Um, as Jim said, there are a lot of claims that were filed. In fact, it, it, we estimate that there's about 101,000, a little bit more than 101,000 claims that are filed. Of that group of claims, there are many duplicates. There are many that have been amended and superseded. And there are some that have been filed on behalf of the same claimant by more than one law firm or even the survivor, his or herself. And so um, when you back out all of the duplicates and the amended and superseded, we estimate that there's about 83,800 claims and uh, of unique claims. And sort of that's where things start. And so from there, and I'm gonna put up a document here on the screen and I could sort of walk you through it. And this document is already up on the ESA.com uh, website. And so this will give sort of an overview of what I'm going to show you here. And it's sort of what I just said, but there are four exhibits and each exhibits breaks down claims. And so we'll go to exhibit one. And so exhibit one breaks down the claims um, of when the abuse occurred in which year. And so this is the first year of abuse that's alleged in the claim. And as you can see there, there are you know, uh, I'm not sure, I'm just sort of trying to scroll up and now so everybody can see, um, you know, oddly enough, there's some claim, there's a claim that's, that's listed there in 1905. And um, the reason why I'm pointing that out is for a couple of reasons. Um, BSA didn't exist in 1905. Um, I think it's unlikely that there was a claim in 1905 because of that. And, and I think that, you know, the way the claim 
process is working, the information is being extracted out of the claims and it's getting put into a, an Excel spreadsheet and there's some administrative errors happening. And, uh, the TCC is bringing this to the attention of the BSA and the BSA's professionals and to making sure that the, uh, that the, that the information extraction or exportation is um, administratively consistent and correct. And so uh, probably what happened there that that claim is probably 1995 or 1985. Uh, John, I would just like to point out the problem isn't so much that the Boy Scouts didn't exist in 1905, but that person would be 116 years old. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, if we could all have his or her genes. So, <laughs> and down there at the bottom, there are approximately 1,500 claims um, that do not allege a date as when the abuse occurred. And, uh, and, you know, and so we have recently sent out emails to um, many of the parties who are represented by council, um, alerting this, them to this fact that, hey, your claim does not allege um, a period in time when the abuse occurred. And we're encouraging people to um, amend the claim to the extent that that information is not present in the claim. Moving on. This slide here shows how many claims are filed in which they allege um, which state or jurisdiction that the abuse occurred in. Um, and as you can see there on top there, there are approximately 9,300 claims in California. You go down and there are 990 claims in Kentucky. There are 5,200 claims in Texas, 17 claims in Mexico. Um, and so we go on and, and we have sort of outlined um, sort of where the claims are falling in. And so as you can see that there's a row here, it's called ZZ. And in 3,600 claims, um, there wasn't a, a location put. And there's also YY, which is unknown. There's 3,500 claims that there wasn't a location um, inserted into the proof of claim. And so um, to the extent that your claim does not identify the location of the abuse, then we're encouraging people to amend the claim. And there's an instruction form on how to amend your claim on the tccbsa.com website. John, uh, this is Jim. I'd like to interject for just a moment. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that have been at prior town halls, you have heard me and John talk at length about the need to go back and check your claim form to make sure it is complete. This is the best example of the problem. I cannot figure out, if I don't know where the abuse occurred, I can't figure out whether a statute of limitations hurts you or helps you. I can't figure out, and we'll get to local councils in a moment, which local council you might even have been at. This is something that we think should be easily cured. It would help all survivors, everyone, to get this information filled out. I cannot speak too strongly about this. This is an easy fix, folks. Please fix it. It's making our job extremely difficult with this many claims missing this basic information. And I'll tell you, forget about our job, the insurance companies thrive on this. How can this be a valid claim if the person's not even telling us where the abuse occurred? Maybe we understand you don't remember the perp's name or you never knew his last name, but you don't know where the, oh, this claim must be, must be fraudulent. We have to throw out um, 3,600 claims. So it's not just our job. We're trying to make this work you need to help us on this. We can't fill this information in for you. Thank you, John. Yeah, and, and John, I wanna add on something again, not to pile on too much, but the, some of you might be scratching your head and you're saying, well, Jim, what are you talking about? I, I put Texas down in the claim, but, and, and many of you did, I think, did do something like that, but there's a specific section in the proof of claim and it says, where did the abuse occur? And it's, and it's important that you know, if Texas happens to be the location that you put Texas in that section. 
you know, I know that many people inserted a narrative and it might say it happened in, you know, Corpus Christi, Texas or something like that. And, and it's put there. It, it's important that it's in the right section. And I'll move on here and, and I'll explain maybe in a little bit more of a different example about why it's important. So um, this exhibit here um, describes or breaks up the claims um, that implicate different local councils. And as you can see here at the top, there are just under 40,000 claims that do not identify a local council. And, um, and so I, I came across an example the other day where somebody emailed me and they said, what are you talking about? I identified my local council. Here's my proof of claim and look at it. And this is what happened on that claim. Um, the first question was, what troop were you associated with? And then counsel for that survivor said, you know, I, Troop 67 in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, the Winnebago Council. And it was all on the same thing. And, um, and it was a perfect answer. It, it was very, I should say, it was a very thorough answer. But it, they needed to break up the answer and put the local council in the local council part and put the sponsoring organization in the sponsoring organization part and put the location in the location part. And so sometimes um, the answers are, too many answers are going in one spot when they need to be distributed elsewhere in the proof of claim. So um, this here, you know, breaks out. So obviously, you know, we're, we're showing here that there are, you know, over 1,400 claims against Michigan Crossroads, over 1,300 claims against the Greater New York Council. Obviously, this is an undercount if there are a little over 39,000 that haven't been implicated or per, you know, a, a proof of claim form haven't been assigned a local council. And just so you know, as you'll scroll down here, it's about this part of the schedule is about 16 pages. Um, you know, Greater New York Council will pop up elsewhere because it is, you know, there might be a claim where or somebody says Greater New York Council and Greater Los Angeles Council. And so that will count as one. And so there will be different instances. And so I know that the Greater New York Council has probably about 75 more than the 1300 that are showing here. And last here, let me just scroll through really quickly. The last exhibit, and it is a long exhibit, it is the exhibits that implicate sponsoring or chartered organizations. And um, it is many, many pages long. And I'll just show you the first page here. And it shows, you know, Methodist Church, Baptist Church, Catholic Church, um, uh, Latter day Saints, US Air Force Base, Boys and Girls Club. Um, you know, Lions Club or different police departments and fire departments or park associations, um, so on and so forth. And, you know, those are outlined there. And also, as you can see, there are about 48,000 claims that have not listed a sponsoring organization. And John, you said earlier that all this data is going to be out at the tccbsa.com website. It's there right now, John. Great. So folks, we are <clears throat> bumping up against uh, the top of the hour, and we told you we were going to try to keep it to an hour. So, so here's what I'm going to do. We've got uh, some questions that have been submitted. I'm going to read the questions, um, and if those questions answer or interest you, you can hang around and listen to the recording. Well, I mean, you can listen to us talk about them, or you can come back and listen to the recording at a later time. So we're probably going to go another 10 minutes I hope that's okay. Uh, question number one, if mediation is not successful, what happens? How will that affect payments? We are actually in a mediation right now. Question two, how do the professionals get paid? Question three, how does plan voting work? Can one or two survivors derail at all? I think Jim's talked a lot about that. We've talked about what happens with respect to claims outside the statute of limitations. So I don't think we need to address that one. What would a liquidation look like? Many of you are interested in that. And then when should survivors hire personal counsel? I think the answer to that is now. But um, I'm going to take those one at a time, and we're going to go for about another five or 10 minutes. So feel free to jump off and come back and listen to the recording. Uh, Jim, if mediation is not successful, what happens? How will that affect payments? The mediation process is an effort to try to reach a consensual resolution, to streamline the timeline, and to streamline the expenses. But if the Boy Scouts cannot reach an agreement with the abuse survivors, 
it can still go forward with its own plan of reorganization. And as I've said before, well, actually, I'm not sure I said this, but maybe it's evident, that plan was not the result of a negotiation with us. Um, there were discussions. There are some aspects of the plan that do reflect our input, but that is not a negotiated document uh, from the way, way I think of one. And so if we don't have a mediated resolution, the Boy Scouts might still try to get their plan approved. Um, and during the timeline, work to try to reach resolution. But um, the failure of the mediation does not stop the bankruptcy process from going forward. Okay. Uh, Doug, this one's for you since the TCC was responsible for actually hiring all of our professionals. Um, could you answer the question on how do the professionals get paid? Sure, the, the payment for professionals, for all professionals comes through the bankruptcy plan. So it, it isn't a factor of, uh, of individual victims getting billed or, or anything like that. It's part of the plan is the payment of all the, of all the professionals. And uh, I, I know that oftentimes in bankruptcy, it gets to a, 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 a spot where people start saying, well, you know, all this money's going to all these professionals. And, and I think, John, you'd agree that we really want uh, every victim to know that, that these professionals are working incredibly hard and have just done an amazing amount of work. Uh, you know, without a doubt, we hired the very best professionals, not only uh, Jim and John, but also our insurance professionals and our financial consultants uh, as, as well. So uh, yeah, it is- and, and, and you guys should know also that- yeah, I was just, just going to say, I was just going to say, John, it's a, it's a cost of doing business, but it does not get billed to individual victims. Yeah. And, you know, all of that's part of the public record. Every uh, professional had to submit an application. And we yeah. do a very rigorous finance committee that reviews every single bill from every one of the professionals before it that's, gets to us. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. We, we have three or four victims, uh, members of the TCC that review bills every single month. And, and John, I would add that for the Bachelski firm, 10% of our billing is going directly to the settlement trust. That was something we agreed on, um, off, agreed on and we're happy to offer uh, at the time we were retained. Yep, thank you for that. Uh, you've already talked about how the plan voting works, but the follow on question, can one or two survivors derail it? Uh, um, not on a voting basis. Yeah. Uh, the, the court will look at two things. How did the class of creditors vote? And the class will have approved the plan if two thirds of those voting say yes. So you know, one or two people will not on the vote aspect derail the plan. Now, each creditor does get to insist that they be paid through the plan at least as much as they would get if the Boy Scouts liquidated that that is a creditor by creditor uh, objection. It cannot be overridden by the vote of the class. And that is something that uh, honestly, the TCC and other survivor groups are focused very much on. What is the value of BSA? What is the value of the claims against parties getting released under the plan? And how does that compare to what they're offering? Uh, I think you've, you really did a deep dive earlier on statute of limitations. So I think I'll skip that one. Um, what would a liquidation look like? So under the bankruptcy code, there are, I'm sorry, let me start over. The bankruptcy code has different chapters. There's chapter seven, which you've heard about. That is a liquidation. There's chapter 11. That's what we're in. It has its different rules from chapter seven. You have chapter 13s. Some people may have heard about those in bankruptcy advertising. Chapter seven is a liquidation of the company. An independent trustee is appointed and that trustee liquidates the company. Creditors are not allowed to put a nonprofit entity like the Boy Scouts into a chapter seven bankruptcy. They can't, that's why for all the creditors that existed at the beginning of this just before the bankruptcy, no creditor group could put the Boy Scouts into bankruptcy. You're just not allowed to. Once they're in bankruptcy, chapter 11, the court cannot convert the case to a liquidation bankruptcy over the objection of the Boy Scouts. And so if the plan fails, 
the Boy Scouts voluntarily could go to a Chapter 7. That's not going to happen. Or the case could be dismissed if the court found that a plan could not be confirmed. At that point, everyone goes into their own directions. And if you get a judgment against the Boy Scouts and you can find something to execute against, that means to enforce your judgment, then you go do that. So um, there is no bankruptcy liquidation option for the Boy Scouts unless they voluntarily go into it. Okay, thanks. And then the last question we had was when should survivors hire, hire a personal counsel? Okay, this has always been the question of the town hall. And the first one, I kind of skipped, dodged it, whatever you want to call it. Um, we are getting to a point. We're not there yet, folks. You're not being asked to vote on the plan, but we're getting to the point where decisions are going to have to be made by you regarding your claim. How, how, how long, Jim? I think it'll be at least two months. It could be longer, um, but it's not tomorrow. So just you don't have to hit the phone tonight to the first phone number you're fine. I believe it is critical that you retain someone who has experience in the representation of child sex abuse victims. The TCC and the other creditor groups have bankruptcy lawyers up the wazoo. You know, we're not gonna let the bankruptcy process hurt survivors. So I think the focus should be on an abuse attorney as opposed to finding yourself a bankruptcy attorney. That abuse attorney has a Rolodex, if people still have Rolodexes, of other lawyers' names, and they'll find a bankruptcy attorney. They can call John Lucas. <laughs> Don't call me. They can call John. Uh, we have Q&A. We get back to people. We do return phone calls. Um, and so where do you find these names? If you go into your browser and type child abuse attorney uh, Boy Scouts, there are still attorneys who are advertising on the internet uh, who have experience. Uh, unfortunately, there's some people who advertise who don't have experience. That's for you to figure out. When you call, you're not required to hire the first lawyer. You call. You only hire a lawyer when you have signed a retainer agreement. And so talk to the person who answers the phone. That may not be an attorney. You should find out are you talking to a call center? Are you talking to a paralegal? Or are you talking to an attorney? And if it's an attorney, is that the attorney who's gonna work on your case? You are a consumer of legal services. Be informed about it. And then find out what that person's going to do for you, but also what they're not going to do for you. Because some lawyers will say, I'm gonna do X, but I'm not gonna do Y. And then you'll find out how much it's gonna cost. Most of the attorneys who are representing abuse survivors are doing it on a contingency fee basis which means a percentage of your recovery. So there are internet resources, there are state bar and local bar association resources, and be an informed consumer of the legal services that you're retaining. Yeah, Jim, can, can I just add too that it's important for any victims that are considering legal action, bankruptcy is also separate from what, what might happen in a state as well. So make sure when you talk to an attorney, make sure you're all on the same wavelength, whether or not you're discussing the bankruptcy process or filing suit in a state, whether they'll do both of those or one of those. Don't assume that both of those happen at the same time because they don't. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. And thank you, uh, panelists, tonight. So we went about 10 minutes over, um, but I thought the content was really rich tonight, a lot of detail. Guys might need to take some notes, look at it again. Uh, remember that we will try to be here the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, you can go to the TCC BSA website to stay up with uh, recordings and things we publish. Please send questions to BSA survivors at PSZJlaw.com. And once again, hang in there, be tough, be patient and we're working for you. Have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Good night. Bye, right, everyone.